All right, today we're live with Alex Sheffrin here today on the Five Minute Bark podcast, and we're so excited. I met uh, Alex at the ClickFunnels convention, which was an amazing experience. I met so many great people there, and he was on stage, and I absolutely got inspired. I can't tell you how many people I've talked about that uh, that speech to, and so it's been really exciting to um, not only share it, but experience it. So, Alex, welcome to the Five Minute Bark podcast. Thanks for having me, Dennis. I'm excited to be here. This is great. Yeah, it's surely great. So, um, I mean, this this speech, I mean, where did all this uh, inspiration come from and all this knowledge that you shared? I mean, it was a good, what, hour and a half, two hour speech? It was so long. I think it was about an hour and a half. An hour and a half. So, uh, yeah. Um, so, so our, our content comes from my background and uh, I, I started businesses very young. I've always run businesses, but when I was about 21, I got very fortunate and became a consultant and worked uh, initially with the Fortune 500, then Global 100, and then some of the wealthiest individuals in the world. And my that experience, that understanding of people that comes from working with people who are at the top of their game um, or kind of move the world around like puzzle, puzzle pieces, that's where most of our content comes from. It's just um, watching that over and over again and studying success in different businesses I've owned for over 20 years. Yeah, it's just uh, it's just amazing because I mean, I, I wish everybody could see that that I don't know if there's actually footage of it on the internet or on YouTube or anything or anything there like is. that. There is okay. I'd love to get a hold of it yeah. and we'll share it with this podcast. But you know, as an entrepreneur, I, I'm me myself being one. I've been an entrepreneur my entire life, so uh, I've never really worked a job besides a two week bet I had with some roommates back in uh, the college days. But um, essentially, I went from professional athlete to a uh, business owner, to now podcaster. And, you know, I didn't know what the real world experience is. I, I actually have a roommate now that says, you know, you should get a job. You should do these things and do this, all these different things. And I'm like, I, I, what would I do at a real job? <laughs> How would I fit in? I'm, I'm, I'm too vocal. I want to make change. I want to make things happen. And it, it really doesn't resonate with me. And it, at the same time, entrepreneurship doesn't resonate with him. So it's like a definite, like you said, it's definitely a human being that's different than the most. So... Yeah, I think Dennis, when you, you know, so, so our, our content is based around the entrepreneurial personality type. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people who think entrepreneurs are business owners, but let's that, let's open that up a little more to just people in general who want to change things, make the world a better place, do new, uh, challenge the status quo. You know, the people who are usually the ones who are, or, or, you know, the, the early adopters, the ones who are thinking about the new things, the ones who are obsessed with making things better are always different than the rest of the world. And throughout history, this personality type has exists, but you know, we get confused in history. We, we, you know, the people who want to change things, make things better, they're often the ones who appear the most broken. There's a reason why Thomas Edison was homeschooled. He was kicked out of school for being slow. The, the single, maybe the most brilliant man in the history of the United States, and, and the one for if he wasn't there, you and I would be sitting here in the dark, was homeschooled because he was kicked out of school as a child. You know, uh, Abraham, or sorry, uh, Albert Einstein failed algebra twice, just like I did. He took it twice, just like I did. So you look at, you know, people throughout history that, that appeared the most broken, that appeared the most challenged, are the ones who go out and change the world. And that's, that's, not, a, that's not a coincidence. Right. It's far too clear a repeated pattern of success. Yeah. Um, Dennis, you had mentioned earlier if that presentation that I did at ClickFunnels was available. So that one exactly isn't, but we have one um, that we put up. It's at mylastname.com. So C H A R F as in Frank E N.com forward slash Sharma, like Robin Sharma. So S H A R M as in Mary A. And, uh, and Dennis, the reason I wanted to make sure that we, we put that out there is most people who've seen that presentation, the thing that they ask that, that I get asked most often is, how do I show that to someone? Yeah, exactly. Right? Uh, no, I, I, I'm telling you, I've run into 20 situations. Like, it, it really, I mean, Alex, I've listened to a lot of motion, motivational speakers in my life. I've, I just got back from Tony Robbins three weeks ago. Um, hmm. You know, obviously, Steven Stevenson was absolutely amazing in his own right. Um, I mean, I've listened to them all. I've been around it. I'm a you know, course junkie, uh, inspirational speaker junkie. I've been an inspirational speaker myself. I've spoken at over 3000 audiences. So it touched me. Uh, it was very unique to entrepreneurs and that's, you know, pretty huge. Uh, but going back to, I mean, I, on the primary bark, I really like to 
kind of help people understand that, you know, there's some sort of transition that happens in our life that makes us become that entrepreneur or become that person that wants to strive in business. And I know, I understand from at eight years old, you were set with a challenge, right? And that essentially that's where the switch in your life came. Can you explain that to everybody out there? Cause you know, everybody, there might be some people that are, that are on the fence and they're like, how do I jump over to the side? And I, I constantly love to share that with every single guest. Yeah, Dennis, I think that, you know, uh, here's what I want everyone who's listening to think about. If, if you're thinking, am I an entrepreneur? Am I one of them? Am I someone who should go do something different? Do I, do I have the capability? Can I do this? My answer is you should, should think about these three qualifications. So when I was eight years old, I was really young. Um, even before that, I knew I was different. Um, I knew I was fundamentally different than those around me. And if, if you've ever felt that way, I think that's part of the qualification of being an entrepreneur. It's, we call it one of the three awakenings. You knew you were different um, when you found innate motivation, that, that motivation that turns on that you can't turn off. And then um, when you heard the call of contribution. And Dennis, I think that's why you're doing this podcast. It's yeah. that, you know, here, here's how the three of them work. The first one is, you know, you're different. You know, you have this awakening or this awareness that you're not like everyone else. Dennis, do you remember how old you were? When I actually, when I transitioned into entrepreneur, four no, years old. No, when you started oh. thinking that you were different. <laughs> you know, I, like I said, four years old. I just, like, you know, I, I remember four. the exact moment because right. I, I, I obviously <laughs> have this on my podcast, but I was, I was at my grandmother's house and I'm actually writing a book about it right now. And I was four years old and I saw baseball on TV and I said, that's me. That's yeah. me. I want to be there. And it happened right there. And from yeah. then, I, I, you know, subconsciously, I re react back to that. I mean, that sounds young, but I was motivated from a very, very young age. I, I wanted so, to be a professional. So could, could you turn it off? No, in no way. Okay, so that's innate motivation. Psychology says external, extrinsic, internal, intrinsic. We have innate motivation. It turns on. You can't turn it off. Mm -hmm. And then the third awakening of the entrepreneurial personality type is the call of contribution. And it's this, this whisper that starts with, hey, Dennis, there's something more important here. There's something more for you to do. There's something that you should be doing. And then it starts growing into like a drone and then a scream that says, hey, go do more. Go we do. call that the call of contribution. When do you remember first hearing that? First hearing that. Um, you know, when I was a baseball player uh, practicing it was constant, like this, just drive in the morning. It was just, it was this machine, like that took over my body that said, you got to go and do, you got to go and do, you got to go and do. Yeah. Um, I ended up not being a professional baseball player. I ended up being actually an extreme sports bike rider. Um, actually I went out to Austin and, uh, competed there a few times, but, uh, hmm. it was, you know, it's just this drive. You wake up in the morning and like, you feel like I can feel it now. The blood is going through your body that you just want to do more. You want to contribute in your own specific way. Right. Yeah. Well, I always say you can't judge contribution. Right. You know, the, one of the big challenges with the entrepreneurial personality type is that our contribution is subjective to us. It's what we contribute. And sometimes the world doesn't understand it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we often judge other people's contribution. And so but here's what I want everyone to know when I talk about the call of contribution. I'm a I'm a business person. I'm a self-made millionaire. Um, I've made other people billions and um you know, I, I, I'm also a capitalist. When people say, what religion are you or what political party are you? I answer capitalist to both and I'm not getting around. But for me, contribution is a shortcut because in the, the capitalist system, capital flows to contribution. If you want to see where money is going or if you look at where money is going, you will find that it's going to contribution. Now, when governments get involved, it's going to the dumb crap. But when and in, you know that's when capital flows to Halliburton. But when in a in a system of capitalism, here's what happens: I'm allowed to take my capital and exchange it with you for your contribution. To me, capital is is it always flows to contribution. So so taking the shortcut and admitting that's what we're trying to do, that just gets us there faster. Mm -hmm. You know those. Uh, I read, of course, I did some homework on you, and sure. there's some. I mean, we all experienced 2007, 2008, and you had, you had some cir circumstances there, but, and we all had detrimental uh, financial crisis. I've had friends who had 90 houses, end up living in studio apartments. Um, so we all know the story. 
but you didn't stop at that. You kind of <laughs> went on to, um, you know, fight it. I, I still yeah. have friends who just don't want to go near anything to do with real estate anymore or anything, but you, you, you didn't stop. You kind of went on and you actually made a statement. You, from what I understand, you <laughs> changed the, the world, so to speak, and helping the, the housing. I'd love for you to explain that because I try to explain that to people too when I say, hey, I'm interviewing Alex here today. Can you explain more about that? Because I think that's pretty powerful stuff. I mean, I know it's sure. not your, your brand right now. Your brand is entrepreneurial. No, like no, no, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it doesn't matter, Dennis. Yeah. No, I mean, it's an, it's an incredibly important part of um, mining Katie's history. When I met my wife in the early 2000s, um, I was a consultant. I, I owned a $100 million plus consultancy. Um, I was traveling about 90% of the time, but I was actively looking for a relationship. So when Katie and I met, I got out of that business quickly, so quickly that there was like weird press release, you know, weird articles and stuff about how I left the industry. Um, but I didn't want to do it anymore. I wanted to be married. And so Katie and I, I was going to like, I sold my company and kind of retired. <laughs> Retirement lasted like a day and a half. And then I started looking at the small real estate portfolio I had. And, and so within a very short period of time, we were buying a ton of property. And then like we did about 1800 deals in or sorry, we did, yeah, we did about 1800 deals in a 12 month period. We were going wow. crazy. Wow. And, um, we, we just finished carting around a 10 by 10 storage box like a year and a half ago with all of our real estate paperwork. We had just <laughs> banker's boxes. You know how you have to keep it for a yeah, certain yeah, amount of time? Yeah, yeah. We just finished that. But anyway, um, so what happened was we, we built this empire um, and we were doing incredibly well. And 2007 hit and we were kind of like watching this slow motion train wreck. But the ground zero for the entire financial crisis everywhere was Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade counties, where we lived and where we owned all our property. Yep. So what happened was we lost everything. Um, we went from having millions in the bank to, and millions in equity to um, you know, two, two years of hurricanes and then the financial crisis, we had nothing in the bank. Our millions in equity flipped upside down within a 12 month period and Dennis, we lost millions in nine months, we went from millions in equity to being upside down 300,000. And in another three months, we were upside down a million. To give you an idea, we owned a property, um, we owned four properties in a place called Stonebridge Gardens. Anywhere from 160 to $180,000 value, the lowest one sold for was 15,500. They lost 90%. And so, when Katie and I went bankrupt, it was brutal. But here's what happened. You know, I, we had, I had been buying a lot of real estate. So I de dealt with a lot of foreclosures and a lot of distressed property, and a lot of fire damage and all kinds of stuff. And in Florida, there's hurricanes, there's water events, there's mold. So people lose properties all the time. And I had kind of figured out how to help them. And when we started getting all our paperwork from the, event to the lenders, I'm getting it from everyone because we had like dozens of mortgages. We were seeing, I saw how bad things were and how it wasn't going to work. The way that they were trying to process all the loans wasn't going to work. I think I had an advantage in that I was a consultant and that I know how to put together process. And so Katie um, and I, we, we, we were going bankrupt and we took um, some information I had called Mastering Real Estate Agents, a book I'd written. We turned it into a, um, a two day course for real estate agents. And here's what happened in, in 2008, <laughs> we taught our first course, January 23rd and 24th, we taught 62 people and it was about teaching real estate agents to help homeowners who were in distress, the certified distressed property expert course. Um, in from 2008, to 2013, we trained over 45,000 real estate agents. It was the <laughs> largest membership in the history of real estate other than the National Association of Realtors and the major brokers. Um, we did about $70 million in business coming out of bankruptcy. We were the number 21 um, fastest growing company in the country on the Inc. 500 list in the first year of eligibility outside of bankruptcy. And we won best places to work every year. We really, we had, I mean, there was definitely challenges. It wasn't all perfect, but of course. we had this, this incredible, and, and Katie and I went from bankruptcy to liquid millionaires within one year of discharge. Now, what I want everyone to understand about that though, is that 
you know, I, I had been a consultant for a long time and I had worked with the most successful people in the world and I had created tens of millions of dollars in, or, and, and really when you look at sales volume, billions of dollars in sales volume through my consultancy every year. And so doing it for ourselves, when we had to do the CDPE, you know, here's, we set up some guardrails, like we wanted to make a difference and we wanted to do it right. And, but we were going to use like our content and see if we could scale a business. Like I had taught other people and like, was it real? We did it with real estate. Was it a fluke? Cause we were bankrupt. It could have been a fluke. And so we did it again. And, um, it was incredible because the, the, in 2009, we, me and Adam Pedowitz, who still is working with us again now, wrote articles about how Bank of America, Washington Mutual, Freddie, Fannie, sorry, in 2007, we, we wrote articles about, how, or sorry, 2009, dang, we wrote articles about how all those guys were wrong and they were under-reporting how dramatic the crisis was mm -hmm. and they told us we were crazy. And we actually, there, there was articles written counter to us saying, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. They're quoting the wrong information. And we were like this tiny little company. We shouldn't even been listened to, but we were making sense. Yeah. One year later, every one of those companies was either taking advice or one of our clients, or they were like flying into Austin to do their broadcast to the market through our studio. We went from those guys don't know what they're talking about to having strategic meetings with every one of them. And we worked with the Treasury, with Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase, Citibank, um, Fannie. Uh, we never worked with Freddie, but we worked with the um, housing or the half the home, whatever, the new housing <laughs> deal and the consumer, um, the Federal Consumer Protection Finance Bureau. And in 2013, the Treasury, Lori Maggiano, one of the directors at the Treasury, said that we pulled forward the foreclosure crisis recovery by at least five years. Not amazing, everybody. I mean, that, we all are. I mean, we all went through that, and it was devastating to so many of us. And you know, Alex, I watched it, Dennis. I watched <sighs> it, man. I, I sat down with so many people that were losing their house. When Katie and I started going through it ourselves, it, you know, the CDP, I, I make it sound like this great business success, but Dennis, yeah. here was our, our slogan from day one, solving the foreclosure crisis, one homeowner at a time. Yep. We knew a realtor right before we finished the course, a realtor we knew um, walked off like a 30 story balcony in a, in a listed condo yeah. in Florida. And that was happening like every two or three days. Yeah. And so we wrote that product because um, I had been on the suicide calls yeah. from people who were losing property and we wanted them to know there was hope. Yeah, I, you know, I developed a software that helped um, loan notification companies try to do the process. And you know, it was just awful because these guys were trying to help and they were turn, and, and the banks were turning them into criminals and stuff like that and they were, yeah. they were trying to help. But the only reason they couldn't get the foreclosure or the modifications done is because the banks wouldn't, wouldn't give. They wouldn't give. That they was my give. life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't give. And, um, you know, so I, you know, I tried to give my part by helping them create a software that could do that. But yeah, I, I, I mean, people are even trying to sue me and I was, I was a software <laughs> company, you know, <laughs> they were so distressed. They were so stressed. And like I said, I had a friend who had 90 properties, $4 million in the bank and ended up in a studio apartment with four kids. You know, yeah. it, it, no, we so, watch that all the time yep. during that, that same crisis time frame was also Bernie Madoff. So oh, yeah. Bernie, so, so, you know, the area we lived in Boca Raton, Wellington, Palm beach, Palm beach County. Um, we had a lot of very wealthy friends and a lot of wealthy clients and, uh, you know, that double whammy of Bernie Madoff and then the real estate market falling apart. Um, I was on four calls where a spouse took the phone and handed it to the spouse who was going to commit suicide within about a month. <sighs> Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. And it happened over and over, over again. And over it was again. terrifying. And it's like, yeah. we built that course cause we felt like we were digging our way out of a hole. Yeah. And I've been to Florida. I, I go there every year to golf and Naples and I saw like, you know, beautiful condos and houses going for peanuts. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. Yeah. People were yeah. buying them on credit cards. Yeah. It was crazy, which leads me to the next thing. And obviously you started this with your wife and a lot of people out there, um, you know, they always say behind every good man is a good woman. Right. And to even be able to do business with them and, and uh, partner with them is even more of a powerful thing if it's done correctly. Is there any advice you would give in that regards? That's a kind of a great one, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that, that that's such a historic view of men and women. I think that um, the fact is, is that um, every entrepreneur, every entrepreneurial personality type like you and I needs their first follower. 
Right. And um, my first follower, the person who believes in me more than anybody in the world is my wife. Right. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think I am who I am today with my, without Katie. And there's no way that I'd be doing as much as I do without Katie. Right. And I think, you know, here's, here's what the coaching that I give every one of my clients, Dennis, and, and the coaching that I give um, my team and that I share with the world is that for entrepreneurs like us, for people who want to change the world, there's two very simple rules for success. Number one is your marriage is the most important thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And number two is transparency in your marriage is absolute. Yep. And, and what I mean by that for everyone is that you don't move forward as an entrepreneur if it's going to damage the marriage and you get consensus and you communicate with that person. Um, I had a really personal experience this weekend. Um, I woke up Saturday morning to a text message from a very close friend of mine, Bob Sokoler, that his wife Noreen died overnight. Wow. And um, God, Dennis, you know, to be the first, I feel so privileged to be the person that, that Bob reached out to. Mm -hmm. Um, he's been my client since January or sorry, since October 7th, 6th, 7th and 8th. He was in my three day event in 2009 and he sat in the front row with his wife, Noreen. And, uh, I'm so glad that he was a client because about four years ago in 2011, I started teaching a different type of class. It's what our content is based on today. Right, right, right. And Bob came to one of those early kind of enlightened leadership events. And um, I got to a place where I've been able to work with him really closely in the past couple of years. And I talked to Noreen in the last two weeks. And um, it was one of those days where I was really busy and I almost canceled the call and I hadn't talked to her in a couple of years. So I took the call and I knew she'd been sick and I talked to her and she shared with me how um, much things have changed and how Bob's doing so much better and how he's calmer and how she and he and his son, like the relationship between he and his son, how, how dramatically different things have been. And um, she was happy and, and she was really hopeful, Dennis. And I think that that's critical to remember. And this weekend, when I talked to Bob, he said, uh, it doesn't matter how often you share that marriage is most important and that transparency is absolute. You're not saying it enough. And he, he also shared, Hey, when you first started saying it, I thought it was too much. Yeah. So, um, I think the secret is you need to treat your marriage like it's the most important thing in your life. Cause it is. And, um, anyone who thinks that they can be successful at the expense of their marriage is building the biggest house of cards you can possibly construct. Mm -hmm. So for me, the advice is you sit down with your spouse, you talk to them, they know what's going on. And if they know what's going on and you've talked it through with them, that means you're making good decisions yeah. or at least they're a lot better than they would be if you're isolating. So I think we each choose, choose our spouse because we need a person who's going to push back and reflect against us. And we have to allow for the space for that to happen. Absolutely. Well said. And thanks, Dennis. You know, I've uh, experienced a lot of that recently myself, and it's just, I i mean, I'm not in a relationship, but I, <laughs> I have my dog that I appreciate every day because essentially that's <laughs> who I'm married to is my dog, and I literally appreciate that dog every day, and I appreciate every person, my friends. I'm always reaching out and making sure they're okay, and and um, because you're right, that's all they have, and right now with starting my business and everything, they are what I have. They're here for me, and they're checking on me all the time, making sure the podcast yeah. is going great and everything. And <clears throat> in our lives, it's like, you know, you can have a billion dollars, but with that billion dollars, you're really trying to buy relationships. You're trying to buy somebody to care, to listen, to learn, to love with. And, uh, you know, you look at the wealthiest people in the world and, and they just want a person they can talk to with authenticity. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of them that the, a lot of the people that struggle at, the, at that level, they, they can't get that because everybody's looking at them on a pedestal, right? And they're not. So there's, there's a lot to be learned from what you said there. I, I totally believe, you know. Yeah, Dennis, and, and, you know, I always share for anyone who's not in a relationship, um, you know, my belief is that people like us always want to be and we're like instinctively driven to be in a relationship. And so if you find yourself in between, um, 
one of the things that I suggest people think about, because a lot of my team is single. Mm -hmm. And so they say, hey, what about us? You know, we can't do that whole marriage is number <laughs> one thing. And it's just simple. You, you become the person that you'd like to be in a relationship with. Yep. I think so many of us um, think about the person who's going to come in and create the relationship we want. And if we become the person we want to be in a relationship with, then we will attract that person. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that means, you know, health and, and wealth and how they look at things and, you know, reflect that and you will find it. You know, I just created a course called Manufacturing Celebrity Status and it sounds kind of weird, but one of the, <laughs> the biggest components in this course is, uh, is, is, is creating authenticity, number one, and connection, all right? In order to generate great business, I'm not, you're living proof of that, you have to have good connection with your clients and people around you. And it's not sitting there and talking to somebody with a cell phone in your hand. It's not uh, wondering what the next email is or this. It's creating that connection like you and I are talking here now where all we're doing is talking to each other. And it's just really one of those most important things that I, I have a roommate who's like, you know, I want to meet somebody. I'm like, well, focus on that. Focus on the mm -hmm. people, the, the women you meet, the, the men that you meet that, that are out there and just give them the best attention. And they're going to have you in mind when they find the right woman. They're going to, that woman's going to be in, you know, whether it's the woman you're finding in front of you or the, it's like this tree that grows, right? Connection is where it all starts, right? So whether it's in business or in relationships, it's all about connection. And we're, we're now we're a, a, a one of my other last past guests said it's we're a bunch of walking zombies out there. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's Facebook, it's this, it's that. And nobody's paying attention to each other, you know, besides through text or, or video or so on and so forth. So it's important for people to, in a one-to-one -one space to create connections. You know, it's interesting, Dennis, is we talk a lot these days and I think this, this word authenticity has gotten like so overused. It's hard to tell what it means Yeah. because, you know, and, and in a lot of cases, <laughs> authenticity is totally misused. Because I've absolutely seen, I've been in situations where somebody says, you know, allow me to be authentic. And then they act like an asshole. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, this, this push for authenticity is, has given people like a weird new guardrail that they can't really understand. Mm -hmm. And so, so I see it a little different. I think that, you know, I, I teach a course on how to become a transformational leader. And in my life, not only have I helped, I believe I have become a transformational leader and I think I have the team to show it. Um, they are open for questions at any, any time of day. You can contact them through social media and figure out if that's true. And I think that, you know, transformational leadership comes from one thing, being present. And that's what I was going to say. Being yeah. in the moment, showing you know, up. in the moment, being in, but not just showing up, being present. I've watched billionaires operate and they operate at a level different than the rest of us. They operate at a level of presence where they don't tolerate distraction. In fact, you know, so many of us are like, Ooh, give me the free podcast. Give me this information. Give me this over here. You know, I'll jump on another book, another webinar, another sales page. Billionaires do not tolerate interference of any kind. They only allow the right information into their lives. And so I think that, you know, for all of us, it's something to think about is, is that, you know, what are you, what are you attracting? What are you bringing towards you? What are you allowing into your life? Sometimes just blocking some of that allows you to move forward. Yeah. Cause you, when you, when you start attracting, you're going to attract a lot, right? And the more, as more success comes, you're going to start attracting a lot of opportunity, a lot of things. But if like you're saying, well, and, if you and, have that focus, you have to have that focus and stay. Well, and Dennis, you know, to, to stay present, to stay in the moment, Here's what that, for me, that, that's, this is what that takes. That means that I, um, I'm not anxious. That means that I'm not worried about what I'm doing next. That means that um, my day, I know what's going on in my day and I have the right amount of support and the right amount of protection for my team to get it all done. Um, that means that financially and, and you know, otherwise in my life that things are okay. And that allows me to be present. Um, the challenge is that, you know, I, I slip in and out of presence. I can get out of it just like anybody else yeah. can. And the challenge is you have to constantly be vigilant about lowering the pressure and lowering the noise in your life. And most entrepreneurs do the opposite. We invite it into our lives. Yeah. I love that. I, I, you touched me on that because I, you're right. You have to be vigilant. Yes. Yeah. Vigilant. I find myself anxious quite a bit. So um, I'm always wanting to move forward and, and if I just relax, everything happens correctly and smoothly and the right way. But if I'm yeah. 
pushing it, right? It just gets a little shaky. (laughs) Well, and Dennis, you know, the challenge is for so many of us, that pattern of put your shoulder down and push through it or grin and bear it, or I'll get through this or, you know, any of those things. Here's the, here's the, the, the thing that we learn. We learn over time is that, okay, that, that can create success, quote unquote success. Here's what I would propose that grin and bear it, push through it, bear down all of those things. What it really creates is an outcome. It creates something. But you have to get to the point in your life where you're not willing to grin and bear it anymore, where you're not willing to put your shoulder down and lean into it, where you're willing to get really passionate, really crazy about something and then give your entire life to it. But it never feels like you're working hard. It feels like you're moving towards something. And, you know, the, the transition of running from what we don't want in our lives, which is what most people do most of their lives. In fact, I think actualization is the transition of running from what we don't want to definitively running towards what we do. Yes, absolutely. Alex, this is awesome. I don't want to take up, we've already gone double the time we usually do. (laughs) Usually (laughs) 20 minutes. I don't want to take up your day. I know you're a very extremely busy person. I totally want to say I appreciate you. I appreciate you coming on the podcast and the five minute bark. And I hope my listeners appreciate everything here today too. And we're going to get you all the information on what Alex is offering. Um, I know he's got a lot going on. He's got some courses, he's got some uh, seminars coming up and he's got obviously some stuff that's online here. And, um, wow, I just, I just appreciate this. This is really great. And, um, you gave it 110% and it's pretty obvious of that, you know, Always, uh, brother. And, if you uh, ever want to do a part two, I'm available. Okay. And um and yeah, and if anybody wants to kind of see more on the entrepreneurial personality type, they can go to again my last name, sharfin.com yep. forward slash preview. Awesome. Yeah. You know that's something I want to definitely talk about real quick. Can you talk about this real quick? Just a quick summary about the, the EPT? Th- yeah, please. Sure. Sure. I think I mean, that, I'm not trying to cut you off. I just, I just want no, to no, respect no. your sure, time. Sure. So, absolutely. So, so just real quick on the entrepreneurial personality type. Um, anybody who wants to can go to sharfin.com forward slash preview, and they'll they'll kind of you can you can understand more about it. But here's our belief, and here's here's what our organization is truly moving forward in the world is that the entrepreneurial personality type is a subpopulation of people. It's a meta population. We are different. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably one of us. I know Dennis and I, you know, we're different than most. We are physiologically sensitive, momentum-based beings. We are programmed to drive forward, to want more, to make more out of the world. And, you know, in, in my life, when I was younger, I was very different and uh, so different that I stood out. I started studying success. And what I found was there is a consistency, consistency to success that people who have created incredible outcomes in the world were always different and appeared broken, just like me. And they had the same types of diagnosis that I had, the same types of quote unquote symptoms that I had, and the same types of symptoms and diagnosis that all of my wealthy friends have. And the difference between me when I share the fact that I've had an Asperger's and ADD and a autism diagnosis in my lifetime and my friends who run multi-billion dollar companies is that I don't have shareholders so I can share. They can't or they would be. Yeah. And, and imagine what it would do to their companies if they did. The reality is, is that throughout history, people like us have always felt different. But if you're one of the people who has felt different and you felt like there was more for you and you want to drive forward and change things and you're not like the rest of the world who strives to become average and desperately clings to the status quo, you are probably one of us if that makes you feel queasy because We want to change things and make it better and make the world a better place, create a contribution, run a business, declare our place in the world and make it so. And if you've ever felt like this, you've probably also felt different, like a party of one, isolated and alone. And if you've ever felt this way, I want you to know something. It's not that you don't have a tribe. It's that you are part of the most important tribe in history because people like us throughout history are the exclusive source of positive human evolution and we always will be. So right now, 
think back to anyone who you remember, anyone who you feel matters to be remembered, and you will confirm for yourself that they are just like us. So to everyone, I want you to understand that it's not that you are alone or different. You are part of the most important part of history, one of the most important groups in history, and part of the segment of the population who creates our future. I have one message for you. There is nothing wrong with you, and you are not alone. Awesome. Alex, thank you so much, man. I don't even, I can't even thank you enough. This is awesome. And, uh, thanks Dennis. I think that was better than the speech yet. <laughs> Quick <models. laughs> Thank you. Brother. Um, I'm glad. Really this is, this I'm, format. I'm glad this video too. This is cool. It's gonna be great. And you're going to love seeing it yourself. It just, uh, it brings tears to my eyes. <laughs> thank wow. You, um, awesome. Everyone, Alex Sheffrin here today. Um, five minute bark podcast. This is going to be an episode you'll watch 20, 40, 50 times. <laughs> uh, as most of my guests are, they're just all amazing and they're giving. This guy gave 102,000% here today um, in this podcast. And um, I hope you guys appreciate him and reach out to him. And is there anything you want to share about your company with the audience or anything? We've got a ton of stuff going on, Dennis. Um, you know, jump into the, either the, the Sharma um, preview or sharfin.com forward slash preview. Uh, I'd love to have you come down to Austin. We've built this amazing event center. We get some, some incredible people here and there's information on our events online. I love it. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We'll talk soon. <laughs> <laughs>